Well, as uh, we just mentioned, Ed and Alan are going to be here this next week, and we actually had this idea that maybe Jake and I just wouldn't come for the first part of service, and we just have Ed and Alan out there greeting and, and leading and all that, just so people go, wait a second, what just happened here? So this is about the time where I would normally point your attention to Facebook. However, technology is betraying us this morning, and Facebook is taking a Labor Day weekend uh, on the live stream. So you won't be able to share the live stream there unless you like do the shaky cam v- version of it yourself. But let me just tell you, Facebook has uh, done some things in my life, some things that I have to answer for at times. Because I don't know if you know this, but in in today's day and age, if you want to get to know somebody, what do you do? You don't go talk to them. You see if they're on Facebook or social, right? And then you read through their posts. You scroll through their information. Well, one aspect of my Facebook page has caused more questions than any other. It's my name. You see, on Facebook, my name is Lee Whosoever brown and invariably I get people who will come up to me who I've maybe never seen before or maybe I'm just getting to know them kind of in that early phase and they'll come up to me and they'll say not why are you so devilishly good looking you know that's that's never the question I get it's always is whosoever really your middle name like your parents really named you whosoever and I have to say no Whosoever is not my middle name, Lee is my middle name. And then, of course, they ask the question, so what's your first name? And I'm like, I'm sorry. I guard that information. You know, may, okay, I'll, I'll let you guys in. My, my first name is Ernest, but it's spelled E-A-R, like ear nest. Ernest Lee Brown, Jr. So maybe you can see why Lee Whosoever Brown works so much better on Facebook Well, the reality is, actually, I picked that uh, moniker, if you will, up many years ago. But to to tell this story, I have to kind of go back to 1998. My buddy and I, David, my best friend growing up, have this concert that we just can't wait to go to. And ironically, it's called Family Values. But the names on the marquee are Corn and Ice Cube, and Rammstein, and Limp Biscuits. They were just brand new at the time. And the other one I won't even say in church, you know, um, although that word is in the Bible, we'll just leave it there when we get to it and that going through it, uh, you know, organically here. But we go to this family values tour because we identify with what these guys are talking about. I don't look like it. You know, I, I've, I've never been heavily pierced or tattooed, but growing up, I was kind of the outcast. I listened to heavy metal music. I dressed like goth because Wyoming got the goth trend like 10 or 20 years too late. I went to this church, my buddy David and I, and we actually got asked like, why are you here? That's what it was. That was youth group uh, at a different church for us. And so we identified with these guys because they spoke to those who were down and out. They spoke to the outsiders. Well, lo and behold, the band Korn, who was one of my favorite at the time, a couple years later, one of their guitarists, Brian Head Welch, has this radical encounter with Jesus. Just this radical encounter. To the point where, like, he went and got baptized in the Jordan River, where Jesus was baptized, just because that's where he wanted to get baptized. I mean, that's that's the level. He, he started telling people about Jesus left and right. If, if you get the opportunity, go onto YouTube and pull up Brian Head Welch, I Am Second, and just watch his testimony video where he talks about how he was always the guy who was rich and famous and, and he was always strung out and he was always with different girls and he was always doing all these things that when we talk about wanting a full life, Most people would go to that. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be powerful. I want to be able to say and do whatever I want, right? That's most of us. Well, Brian lived that life and found that it was still completely empty. So he gave his life 
over to Jesus. But then he noticed something really crazy. He noticed that all of the the punk kids, as we'd call them, who were following him, the ones who were wearing chains all over, which, by the way, if you guys could get the wallet chain back in style, my wife won't let me wear one, and I love those things. So if you just start all wearing wallet chains, I could go back to wearing a wallet chain. But anyway, he looks at all these kids, and he realizes that these are the types who most churches aren't going to accept. They just look a little bit too weird. And so he and a few other bands who uh, who were following Jesus and some BMX guys who are all over the X Games decided that they were going to start a new ministry to those that the others might be afraid to reach. And they called that ministry the Whosoevers. It's based out of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes will have eternal life. And so he started sharing this message with these kids who, you know, are at hard rock and heavy metal and rap shows and telling them, look, whosoever can be you. And so these guys, as they're starting this movement, as they called it, They started changing their names on social media so that instead of having their last name, it would be whosoever. And I loved that. But I was also too chicken to change my last name to whosoever on Facebook, so I did my middle name, Lee Whosoever Brown. But there's a a deeper point to this because when you look at this ministry to the down and outs, When you look at Brian Welch and and his ministry, he kind of looks a little bit out there. He's still got that rock star vibe, but he's telling everybody about Jesus. And you know, sometimes when we come to our Bibles, we like to sanitize what we see there. And right now, as we enter into John chapter 1, as we continue through the story as we have been, we're coming across a man by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And let me just tell you, I believe John the Baptist and Brian Welch had more in common than sometimes we're willing to admit. I mean, John the Baptist is out eating locusts and honey. He's dressed strange, and he has a lot of weird people coming up to him, so much so that the religious of his day are coming and saying, hey, what is going on? Doesn't that describe a rock star right there? Weird clothes, got it. Eating strange things, got it. Fan following, got it. But turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, and let's look at how John the Baptist handles this influx of fame. John chapter 1, starting in verse 19, says this. This was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? So pause there for a second. Notice their question. It's not what are you doing? It's who are you? It's a question of identity. And if you look at the subtext to this, they're kind of asking him like, hey, you're a little bit out there. Are you maybe perhaps the Messiah that we've been waiting for? And John says, he didn't deny it, but he confessed In other words, he owned up to his identity and said, I am not the Messiah. And so they go, okay, well, let's regroup a little bit. Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? I like how simple he's just like, no. (laughs) Okay, well, then who are you? You've got this following. People are out here, you're baptizing people, and they kind of say, we need to give an answer to those who sent us. So what do you say about yourself? That's kind of the moment right there for us. When somebody comes to us in our best moments, maybe we've just won an award, or, or maybe we've you know, solved the company's problems, or, or maybe we've been highlighted in you know, the newspaper or something, and somebody comes to us and says, what do you say about yourself? What do we usually answer? Aw, shucks, I'm just awesome, that's all, right? But look at what John says. 
He says, no, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as the prophet Isaiah had said. So John the Baptist or John the baptizer points people not to himself, but to somewhere else. Perhaps you're uh, aware of this idea of refraction. I don't normally talk about the sermon titles because to me it's not that big of a deal. But, but this Sunday's sermon is called Refract. And there's a very specific reason. Because the idea of refraction is when light enters into water, gas, or glass at an angle and it changes the direction and sends the light back a different way. And in that same way, our purpose in life isn't to draw people to ourselves. It's to refract them to Jesus. Our purpose in life isn't to draw people to ourselves, isn't to build up the rock star fan base. It's to point them to a different much better source of life. That's the idea of refraction. And that's what John the Baptist does. He gets people coming to him in the same way that a rock star gets a fan base, right? He is out in the middle of the desert. There's even some commentary you can read about why is he over in Bethany? Like, why is he out of the way But people are seeking him out. He is baptizing them. And it's causing so much of a stir that the leadership system of the day is going, all right, we can't ignore this guy any longer. We've got to figure out what's going on. In those moments like that, it could be so tempting. Somebody comes to you and says, I want to know why are you? Why are you so great? Why do you have such a following? And John points him to somewhere else. In our life groups, so sometimes as, as both pastor and, and as a life group leader, it's tempting for me when somebody comes and says, oh, I have this thing going on, to just immediately say, well, I know the answer to that. It's this right here. All you got to do is A and B and then C. And if you do them this way and that way, and then come back to me when you need some more answers, we'll get this thing figured out. But there's a reason why in your impact guides, under the life group guidelines, it clearly says that we, we aren't the magic answer. That we are there to point people to the true source of life. We are there to point them to the life light. Now, I don't want to rock anybody's boat this morning, maybe just a little. But let me just say this life works so much better when we figure out that we are not the hero in someone else's story. Life works better when we figure out that we are not the hero of someone else's story. Because everything out there right now wants to make us the hero, doesn't it? Instagram tells us if we just get enough likes, enough hearts. Oh, and by the way, to do that, you need to hide all your bad moments and you need to just put all your best moments out there and people will flock to you, right? Or YouTube, I've shared it before, but it's my son's highest brand loyalty in life right now. YouTube. YouTube tells you that if you can just get people to like and share and subscribe, that you will build a fan base. And let's be quite honest, you can make a lot of money that way too. This past week, there's a guy by the name of PewDiePie. PewDiePie is now the first person in history to have 100 million subscribers on YouTube. That's a pretty big following, right? And so everything in our lives is trying to tell us that we need to be the hero. But John the Baptist goes a different direction. John the Baptist tells them that he is not the light, but he is a 
a witness, a voice crying out in the wilderness. He is not the master. He's the mirror. He is not the one that you want to come talk to. He is going to point you to the source of life. Our purpose in life isn't to draw others to ourselves. It's to point them to Jesus. A few years ago, I got the opportunity to interview Brian Head Welch. About 2013, I was writing for Indie Vision Music, this little Christian music website that, you know, allowed me to review albums. And so I got to listen to him early and tell people my thoughts. It was great. But every once in a while, I also got to do these interviews. And most of the time, it was on the phone with some band that, unless you're just really into the Christian music subculture, you've probably never heard of. But every once in a while... They'd throw me one where it was like, hey, you're going to interview this band. And so they'd give me the personal number of the lead singer of Skillet. I still have it in my phone. I've never used it other than that one time, but I have it. Or they'd connect me with the lead singer of Striper. Maybe some of you remember Striper from the 1980s. But this one time, I got to talk to Brian Head Welch. Now, unfortunately, he called from a restricted number. So I couldn't save that one into my phone. But just getting the opportunity to to talk with someone who in so many ways was a, a guide in my formative years as a teenager, it was an honor. It was exciting. And and I'm not going to lie, I was trying to wear my reporter hat and be a good interviewer, but I was also fanboying out just a little as I'm talking to him, as he's like, yeah, sorry I called you late, I was up till 2 a.m., you know, playing music and stuff, and I'm just like, oh, it's okay, dude, it's all right, you live that rock star life, and I'm, I'm here to interview him about this band he has, this new band called Love and Death, and I'm supposed to, you know, point people to this new album, and you know what he keeps doing to me? He keeps bringing the conversation back to Jesus. Time and time again, he doesn't miss an opportunity to say, hey, look, the the reason we're talking is not because I'm great. It's because I'm here to point others to Jesus. And somehow in the midst of the conversation, he starts preaching to me and explaining Acts chapter 17. And I'm sitting here like, dude, I'm supposed to be promoting your album. And he's like, no, 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 just listen. And I just pulled this quote from it because it was so awesome. He's just telling me, he's like, you know how a fish moves and exists in water? Like if you read Acts 17, 28, it says we all live and move and exist in God. Like, Like we are breathing him in. He's all around us. We suffocate without him. I'm just sitting there like, wow. You could be talking about your fame your next multi-million selling album, and you're just caring so much about me, even though you don't know I'm a pastor, it's okay, you're sitting here telling me about Jesus over and over again. Turn to that next section in John. Look at what John's doing in this. John chapter one, verse 24, it says that these people had been sent from the Pharisees. That would be the religious leaders of the day. This is the high council. This is the big wigs of the church. And so they ask him this, okay, we know that you are not the Messiah. You've told us you're not Elijah. You're not the prophet. Follow-up question, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, and if you're not the prophet? And John answered them. He said, I baptize with water. But someone stands among you that you don't even know. He is the one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Look at what John says. They're coming to him and saying, are you the light? And he's refracting them back over to the life light. And he's saying to them, I, I'm not the one you're looking for, but someone is here in your midst And you're not even recognizing him. You're looking to me because I've got the rock star fame. But he's here. And I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Now to you and me, that's kind of a weird phrase, right? But the reality is, back in this day, 
the, the, the rabbis were kind of, you know, I, I keep using the analogy, but they were the rock stars. They were the ones that people were seeking after. They were the thought leaders of their day. And there came to be this practice, this following almost, where students would almost start to worship their masters. And so these religious leaders trying to stop this put forward an edict that said this, all services which a slave does for his master will a pupil do for his teacher, except the undoing of his shoes. So when John says, I'm not worthy to untie his boots, unlace his sandals, he's telling them right there, guys, I am not the master. I am not the one who's worthy. I'm here to point you to someone who's in your midst that you're not even recognizing. And notice, when we talk, get to John chapter 13, you'll see that Jesus, knowing this command from the high council, as it were, bends before his disciples' feet, unties their sandals, and washes them. So John's saying, Jesus is the one. And Jesus is saying, I came to serve. I came to give you life. And that more abundantly. Our purpose in life isn't to draw people to ourselves. It's to introduce them to Jesus. To refract them back to Jesus who's in our midst. He's already at work in their lives. You know, a lot of times we think like, oh, if I, if I have to have a conversation with someone about Jesus, it's gonna be the most awkward thing ever, right? Have you found Jesus? We were talking about it in life group this week. He's hiding behind the sofa. Just look there, it's okay. Have you, have you found salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ and you just look terrified and your face is pale, right? And, and you're trying to tell them about the life light, but you look like you're about to pass out. And if anybody, you know, shined a light in your eyes, you just look. <gasps> right? That's what we do. But the reality is Jesus is right there in their midst. We just have to reflect people to them, to him, to point out how he's already working in their lives. As followers of Jesus, our role is very similar to that of John's. Every one of us has somebody who comes to us. Somebody who comes and says, hey, I need your advice. Or, hey, you know, you're the smart one in the group. And you're like, yes, I am. Thank you very much for noticing that. We are not the life light, But we point the light towards them and point them towards that light. Now, I want to ask the question that maybe some of you have been thinking, why is the baptismal tub out today? Who are we baptizing? And the answer was shame. As far as I know today, no one. No one. In fact, it's been far too long since we've baptized someone in this place, in this tub. We baptized Donald many months ago. But you know what? I think it's time we start having those conversations again. And I want to put this out there as a reminder of how simply God can work in our lives. My buddy David, the same guy who drove with me to Denver. Actually, my mom drove us to the Family Values Tour. And then after the concert, she had been sitting out in her Toyota Tundra pickup truck. And, and she just said the very mom thing. Did you enjoy the concert? because I could hear it all from right out here. You didn't even have to go inside. We were like, yes, mom. Yes, we did enjoy the concert. But my buddy David, you know, he, he hasn't walked the straightest path towards Jesus all of his life. He's had moments of failure and moments of doubt. But a few months ago, his daughter came to him. He just said, Dad, I want to follow Jesus. And he had that deer in the headlights look. And his body got all pale, and he was like, I don't know, hold on. And all of a sudden, I get this phone call. He's like, Lee, my daughter wants me to baptize her. I was like, that's awesome. I don't know what to do. 
It's like, it's okay, David. I'll walk you through it. And so he starts having this conversation with his daughter. And then as his daughter gets more and more excited about this, his mom starts chiming in. She's like, David, I don't know if you realize this, but I've wanted to be baptized for 40 years. But no one would baptize me in the river, and that's the way I want to do it. So he called me up. He said, hey, will you come baptize my mom and my daughter? And two weeks ago, I drove up to Wyoming. I met with my best friend growing up. But I didn't just baptize his daughter and his mother. If you notice in the pictures, I made sure he was right there beside me this whole time. Because I wanted him to know clearly, look, I'm not the light here, guys. I am here to help you be a light for your family. And so David baptized his daughter. He just didn't know he was doing it. I gave him the words, and then he dunked them down, and I was just kind of there to help. All it took was a simple conversation with someone who recognized that Jesus is in the room. Jesus is in their life. He didn't have to have all the answers, and neither do you. I think one of the unfortunate things about the way we read our Bible is we see the term John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, and we think, oh, that means he's the guy who's supposed to do it, right? And therefore, that means that only our clergy are the ones who are supposed to do it. The reality is God wants you to be involved in other people's lives and tell them about Jesus. Refract that light back to him. And guess what? After you've had those conversations, he wants you to lead them in to that next step in baptism. That's not my role. I'll do it. But my role is to empower you guys to do it. Last night, as I was putting my son to bed, knowing what I was going to preach about this morning... I opened up the conversation with him. And let me tell you, I don't know why. I could talk to any of your kids about baptism, but it comes to my son, and I'm like, dude, so what's this Jesus thing like, huh? How's it going? You like Jesus? Can can we we dunk in water? Would that be great? I had that conversation as awkwardly as I could to say, dude, if you know what it means to follow Jesus, I would be honored as your dad to get to baptize you someday. And you know what he said to me? Well, I don't know, maybe tomorrow. I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll think about tomorrow. That sounds good. I was like, no, 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 let's, let's cool off. Let's, I really want you to understand what it means to follow Jesus. Like, okay, all right, Dad, we'll talk about that. And he's just like casual as can be, and I am freaking out inside. Again, could do it with any of your kids, wouldn't have any issues at all. My own kid, and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. All of us need to get to that spot where we move past our own fame. We move past our own fear. And we point others to the source of life that is rich and satisfying and abundant. And so I put this tub out here. And I might leave it up. Not so that I can call on people and say, hey, I'm going to baptize you. But because as you're praying over your one that we started looking at in the Uncharted campaign, that you took the meeple for and started praying over, and the air conditioning system said amen, I like it, that you would maybe have that conversation with them and you would start thinking in your mind, what would it look like if I got to baptize that person? Your friend, your family member, your son, your daughter, your mother, your grandmother, if they have not been baptized as a believing adult, that you would have that conversation and just say, hey, I would be honored to get to be the one to do it. And just like my son, even if you're awkward with it, it's going to be okay. As we transition back into time of worship through music, I want to open up the altars as we normally do. But I also want to leave this here because I couldn't lift it up and take it away anyway as a reminder that each of us is called to be those who reflect the light, who refract people back to Jesus and who say, hey, I would be honored 
if you would follow Jesus in baptism, and I want to be a part of it. So as we transition in that time, I'll open up the altars here. If you would like to go and have self-guided communion, stop by here, but go over and, and just tear off a little piece of the bread. Dip it in the cup and have that reflective moment to say, Jesus, who is it that's in my life that I just need to point you out to them? I just need to be, that's my only role. I just need to point out what you are doing in their life. If you have your connect cards or your offering, you can also drop that in the plate. That's a, a part of our discipleship journey as we give back to God from what he gave to us. But let's honor Jesus in this moment and think about who it is that he is calling us to have that conversation with. Lord Jesus, God, we've gotten to a, a point in most of our lives where talking about you is something that we leave to the quote unquote professionals. But that's not the way you saw it. Jesus, you sat with 12 stinky fishermen, some lawyers, some religious zealots, some tax collectors, 12 guys who by all accounts weren't the A team to go and change the world. And yet you empowered them to speak into others' lives, to lead them into baptism, to lead them to follow you. Jesus, as we continue in this two-year journey to pray over those names that are in this stage, those names that we took that little meeple for, God, would you give us the boldness to maybe just ask them, where's Jesus in your life? Where is Jesus in your life? And as you reveal yourself to them, give us the courage to say, you know what? I don't know where you're at now, but at some point I would be honored to be the person who gets to lead you into baptism, who gets to lead you into following Jesus with the rest of your life. Jesus, would you give us that boldness? And even if we don't have the boldness, would you give us a passion for you that supersedes our fears so that even as shakily as we're able, we can take that next step. Jesus, we open up this time. You're already here. Would you make yourself known? Would this moment be like John the Baptist where we just are able to point out your presence in our lives? In the lives of others. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.